last um, for this final session is for um, our artists and uh, uh, curators um, to um, sort of respond to the to the plan. They may be sort of directly responding, but the main sort of prompt was uh, to look forward. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Danny. Um, but yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Aaron, very much, and thanks to everyone in the audience. If you're um, just arriving today or if you were here with us yesterday, we appreciate your um, uh, participation and your patience. Um, I think it's been, we haven't done this in the five years that I've been here, so I really enjoyed um, putting together a kind of symposium of uh, practitioners uh, mixed with scholars and curators um, to talk about uh, current issues in public art. Um, and there were some really memorable things for me. I think the one thing that I took away most of all was uh, something that uh, Tracy Hall actually said uh, this morning uh, at her session, which was, um, uh, we are the monuments. There's a kind of um, identification with public art that's not to be um, underestimated that people have. Um, we talk about whether things are community generated or driven. Um, we talk about the role of the public. Uh, we talked a bit about um, historical monuments that uh, are flashpoints of controversy and historical monuments that we ignored and stopped looking at that have histories that um, uh, jump out from behind a curtain and um, we suddenly realize our own, our present is not that far away from our past. Um, and we had a, a, a person who was here who advocated for keeping all monuments no matter what, a preservationist who was, um, you know, dedicated to the idea of um, a kind of dedication to the artwork. Uh, but that really runs up against this issue of the public's identification with art in public places. So um, I don't know if that really stuck with me. Uh, but this is all part of an attempt to introduce this last session and try to sum up. Uh, the artists who are uh, joining us today were part of our uh, process of um, developing this public art plan. And the plan itself did not end up being what we envisioned it at the start. Um, it went through many different versions and iterations and strategies, uh, and it was essential for us to have input from a variety of stakeholders, uh, those in city government, um, activists and organizers and concerned citizens, people who are interested, and above all, artists, uh, because as public art uh, administrators and curators, that's that's who we really feel we work for and that's who we want to um, have lead us. Um, so all of the uh, five panelists here today were actually part of conversations, somewhat informal but recorded conversations that we had with artists. We concocted some um, uh, thematic titles for these uh, conversations and I just wanted to tell you what they were and who of who of our panelists were in what conversation. Um, there was a conversation called, what is place and whose place is it? I think that was the other thing I took away from our sessions today was the importance of site and the importance of place, and it's a complicated issue. Uh, Joyce was in that conversation, Joyce Fernandez, welcome Joyce. Um, and Matthew Mazzotta was in that conversation, welcome Matthew. Uh, we had a conversation about sound uh, and it's how artists practice in the sphere of sound in public uh, places. We had a conversation about murals and street art. Um, we had a conversation called Creating Communities. Um, and both Jim Dignan and Emmanuel Pratt uh, were in that conversation and contributed to it. We talked about uh, the Picasso. We talked about the Wall of Respect. John Pounds was in that conversation. John is all the way over at my right. Uh, and we had a conversation about embedded artists. And this just uh, also demonstrates how complex um, are the relationships between art and the public and art and its audience and art and artists 
and art and government. Um, so what I wanted to do was to kind of charge these artists who were involved in the process to a certain extent and who informed uh, the way we ended up writing the plan was to bring them back and actually give them a plan a little bit early. As soon as we had a presentable copy, which was really only, I think, on Wednesday, we sent it to them and asked them to look at it um, and give us feedback and their responses, a kind of cold response uh, to especially the recommendations and the goals, which is um, the part of the plan that's going to drive us forward. Uh, and the part of the plan that we have to really fulfill and turn into policy and turn into practice. Um, so it's a big part of the plan, and I'd like to thank you all for um, taking this on and doing a kind of improvisatory performance here today and have a conversation um, and let things go the way they go. And how I'd like to start is um, to actually, I've changed the order around. I hope that doesn't strike alarm into any of you. Um, each, each of the artists has uh, given us a few visuals uh, to, by way of introduction. So the um, instructions to our panel uh, were to begin with uh, a kind of introduction. I've given introductions to everybody and I'm kind of, um, I'm handing the ball over now to people who um, I'd like to have introduce themselves. Uh, and to talk about their work for a few minutes and then to connect to one of the items or one of the issues in the public art plan. And then we can kind of collectively have a conversation for a little while and take questions as well. You've also had a few minutes with the plan too and I know that you probably have a ton of questions. We'll also have, um, we have a mailing list of about 100,000 people and you're all on it since you've signed in. We're gonna be sending out information on how you can um, send us feedback and on a variety of um, you know, ways that we can update you on how we're actually going with implementing um, parts of the plan. So let me start with um, uh, Joyce Fernandez, and let me get to Joyce's uh, slides. Pardon? Oh, you took yours out? Well, can you talk, Joyce? Excellent. Can you hear me? Hey, good afternoon. Um, so the introduction part of this is, um, uh, so this is the, I, it's sort of confusing about why I took my images out because I recently retired as um, the executive director of Architreasures for 19 years and, and I decided that uh, in order to fully explain why I've been asked to be up here and respond to the public art plan, I needed to go beyond that, those 19 years, in order to explain myself here. And so, um, I'd like to, s what I'd like to do is uh, introduce myself in a way that, that um, will explain that and say that um, for the last, 19 years, I worked as the executive director of as a nonprofit that works in Chicago neighborhoods, partnering artists with community groups um, in order to transform our urban landscape. Prior to that, I spent 10 years as the director of exhibitions and, ev and events at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago where I was deeply involved in two of Chicago's most infamous cultural controversies. Those experiences led me to change the direction of my career in 1993, taking it out of the halls of one of the greatest institutions, arts institutions in the world, and into the streets of Chicago. Since then, my work has focused on how to bridge the abyss between my community of artists and cultural enthusiasts and this other community, community which includes Cubs fans, as mentioned previously, veterans, and fans of Mayor Harold Washington. So my, my journey since then has included work with DKs. 
um, as an independent curator where I convened an amazing group of cultural um, communities of this city through a public art project called Chicago Portraits, and then as program director of Sculpture Chicago, um, yet another one of our ghost institutions, uh, to curate um, Reinventing the Garden City, a temporary public art project that was done in partnership with the Chicago Park District. And so, um, in short, I am somewhat of a public art geek. And it is not with a, a small amount of interest that I have followed the development of this plan. And so I'm anxious to respond. Turns out I have a lot to say, but I'll turn it over. Okay. Um, uh, Jim, I think, uh, Jim Dignan, we'd like you to go next, and I've got some slides for you, too. Right. Um, good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Jim Dignan. I'm an artist in Chicago. I make objects. That's pretty much my um, kind of focus of these days, maybe throughout my entire life. Um, you know, the in thinking about coming here and introducing myself in relationship to the plan, I thought that um, I wanted to sort of talk a little bit about just sort of being of this city, um, born and raised here, and thinking about my relationship with parks and with alleys, with schools, you know, being sort of kicked out of Chicago public schools and um, getting in a lot of fights. Um, and looking at some of the objects I was, I've been thinking about lately in terms of my work, um, a lot of it reverts back to this, these sort of early days around school life, um, wanting to kind of build my own institutions, whether they be schools or, or parks or play areas or places in which I can sort of speak at, uh, things that I felt I was sort of disavowed, um, points of contest you know, whether they're sort of play apparatuses or, or tools or weapons, they always seem to kind of mark these kind of early years, just sort of being in the city and taking the train and fending for myself. Um, and they just circulate around these sort of ideas around, um, you know, work and school and, and, uh, and sort of being on my own, you know. I mean, I... As a kid, I sold you know, scratch sheets and racing forms on the south side and worked in insane asylums and you know, got involved with the Boy Scouts and always with these sort of remarkably strange jobs and roles and responsibilities in my family. Uh, these objects, these sort of ways in which I made things which allowed me to think differently about my certain circumstances. Um, just sort of helped me to get along with myself, and uh, I just kind of continued to do that. Um, uh, about 25 years ago, I started an artist project called the Stockyard Institute, which was really maybe my first attempt at wanting to set up a platform to really think about kind of neighborhood knowledge. Um, and that's how I'll sort of respond to the plan. It was where I was, I think, invited initially to think about, you know, what is public art? Um, I'm not going to speak for anybody here on this stage, but I think we share um, some particular kind of ideas around our work and that we would do it anyway. Um, you know, I think part of the conversations we had at our panel with, with Emmanuel and Ed Marzuski and, and Tracy Hall were around you know, this idea that you know, some of us have built infrastructures um, because of lack of support. Um, you know, it wasn't about the kind of quality of work, and it was really about building alongside communities um, public ideas. and. Uh, we just wanted to really have the city kind of consider some of these other enterprises that uh, 
that are really important, you know, and things that we've been working on for decades and decades. So, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, Emmanuel, I'm going to uh, find your slides. I've got a few more of Jim's. Do you want to say a word about this um, project of the High Park Art Center? That was um, a project that the Stockyard Institute and a group uh, that's run by Rachel Harper called Seen and Heard organized called Public School, which was initiated by Allison Peters Quinn, who's in the audience. And it was really a, a sort of a, a, another community um, space in which to really look at other neighborhoods around the city and think about just broadening our, um, our ideas about you know, using the Hyde Park Arts Center as a kind of open um, field to uh, just imagine how we might work over the next few years. But uh, there's little Abraham, who was a young uh, son of one of our artists, Nick Hostert, looking up at uh, uh, the 1700 sort of handmade dolls, all representing uh, some child being um, involved in gun violence school bus that I was trying to pitch to Emmanuel, but I didn't get to it. <laughs> Can we still get it? Thanks, Jim. Emmanuel. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so my early earliest upbringing was with my mother, who was an artist. She was a teacher. Um, and she would bring me to a raised single parent in um, early stages now, you know. Um, but she was a teacher of art, dance, and drama, but she was also a teacher of languages. And, and my introduction to school was to her art classes at the school. You know, she would bring me to school, and then the kids would watch me <laughs> while I was, you know. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's always interesting. Who dropped the kid? Um, so my, the, a lot of my practice is praxis, um, treads between a, a search for a, a memory. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of it is a, is a healing process uh, and it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a gut intuition that something is amiss and something is awry that needs to be reconnected. So a lot of the stuff that we do is through, first and foremost, through food and soil and natural systems. So a lot of stuff I do is like public gardens or art, you know, like art in public spaces like, like the gardens, farms, uh, and then also we started recreating, um, reinventing some school uh, abandoned classrooms in, in, in the school. So when you have a wasted space, particularly in a school, we actually started off um, a lot of our practice with Sweetwater Foundation and the, and the network of partners. When you take an empty space and you activate the space and you begin the process of restoring the space, it, 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 it starts a, a translation process, um, which is very intense because most people think about the vacancy that's there in front of them. And there, there, there is a disconnect between the memory of and, and, and hope and possibility of what it can be again. So a lot of the stuff we started to do was how we activate the space through an action that then calls people to come together collectively, that then cultivates the food, that then gets shared with other people, that then figures how, you, how do you begin to restore and reimagine the space or the spaces and then have an indoor-outdoor relationship and then stabilize the space. So the same thing happens with a lot. This, this site that we're here is at 57th and Perry. Um, we started off, um, uh, that actually, that timber frame barn structure that we are kind of calling the People's Pavilion. I think it's, a, it's the first that we know of. It's the first timber frame barn in the city of Chicago since the fire. So what does that mean? What does a barn mean in, in the 21st century? It's not, about, it's not about animals. It's not about, um, it's not about machinery. 
It's a place for people to gather, to celebrate, and it has come out of a farm that used to be the site for um, Mosley School for Bad Boys, an alternative school that got torn down because it was a warehouse for, in a pipeline of prison. So it's like this negotiation of the scarring of what was kind of stripped, people were stripped away, stories and memories were stripped away from this neighborhood. It's a four block radius. The houses are gone. Most people think nothing positive would happen there just from outside perception and then that gets perpetuated through media perception and what have you. So there's constant negotiation with how do we rework our memory, how do we reconnect with our memories, and then actually how do we bring our elders in to help that process? Because most of the elders that come and they know the, the, the taste and the memory of the tomato um, and the plants and the arugula and the chard and all this good stuff and how to cook it, most of the youth that we get involved do not have that connection. So it's this, this repairing process between the intergenerational aspect, but activating a space that then causes you to build the infrastructure that causes uh, a local ownership and participation. So art for us is the catalyst for imagination, for hope and possibility. That then we get to restore the space. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna see if I can find, John, did you send in media? Okay, let me find that. Yeah, oh great. It'll come up. So as a small town white boy yes. who grew up uh, going to very small schools in rather rural places, it's a bit of a contradiction for me to be speaking about urban public art, and yet I embrace contradictions. And I think we all should. We should all know that our actions are contradictory, that our best hopes have opposite sides, and that ultimately that results in something really positive happening. Uh, I've been a sculptor, among other things. I use a lot of power tools, and I show proudly I have all 10 digits, still fully functional. But that has not been the biggest part of my life. The biggest part of my life has been that I have worked with communities all over Chicago to create what would be considered relatively traditional art projects because they are static. They stay there for 10 or 15 or 20 or 40 years and they reflect the community. And yet they're also fairly extraordinary because they actually encourage the community to participate in the creative process to have ownership for it. So among the things that I have learned is that nothing is perfect. Uh, for example, I remember when the CTA public art program was la la really entirely young men with spray cans. And today, there are no young men with spray cans on the CTA anymore. Uh, there's another set of things that go on, but young men with spray cans, and young women at this point as well, have to go to other places in order to create their work. Uh, but culture is everywhere. And what's not everywhere are cultural resources. What I see is an extraordinary downtown, anything within a mile of this very place where we are, there's an astonishing body of work out here, no question. But the cultural resources that could really benefit the residents of the city are not equally distributed, in a sense, across the city in a larger way. And I hope that that's one of the things that will result from this plan. Um, one of the things that's really clear, let me find my notes here, is that public art has moved from being monological to being dialogical. Now, it's not cacophonous yet, but the m monological part was, well, frankly, Picasso and a whole lot of other folks was almost entirely a white modernist man who created a piece that was unveiled. And it's moved toward being dialogical because there are more people, teams of artists, collaborating artists, and community members who engage in dialogues and arguments and find enough resolution to result in work being done. The uh, question is, how do, we, how do we not let the spectacle which exists overwhelm the importance of having work which is also meaningful, deep, trusted, and relational to all of us as urbanists. 
I think it does recall, require dialogue, but re for administrators, I will say I know as an administrator, uh, because I was that as well with Chicago Public Art Group, I have to lose control of the, of the dialogue. I can't control it. The difficulty is trusting artists, because largely we're di we distrust artists, largely as a culture, but we, we, it's difficult to trust artists when we don't know what they're going to do but I really encourage us to, to hire artists who we don't know what the outcome will be sometimes. Now similarly, by the way, I'm interested in the if possibility the people who are the curators of public art programs like the CTA or the City of Chicago, I believe each of them should once a year get to choose an artist that they want to work with just because they want to work with that person because I think that the curator's choice in that case would be interesting to see as well. But I also believe that the public should have a voice and a say and a place and the ability to name and claim spaces that are close to where they live. So in reality, we live in a segregated city. It's historically deeply segregated. It's also a conservative city. That's just the nature of Chicago. There is some discomfort with the notion of social justice in the city, though that is gradually slipping away as is our segregation patterns gradually slipping away, but we have a good di distance to go yet. Among the other things we have, I think, here in the city are what I'll describe as siloed departments, city departments, and I know this plan begins to address that, which I'm really glad for because I know that other cities, I have the good fortune to know a lot about what's going on in other cities. There are other cities where the city departments have cultural officers or co cultural agents who work with the cultural program all the time and create astonishing, not just projects, but funding streams for projects, because those agencies believe in this as well. And that's an area where this plan begins to address it, but it's gonna take us and the team at DCASE to raise the consciousness, and I hope the willingness of politicians and other administrators in the city to embrace culture as being pervasive as clean water should be. Culture should be everywhere, clean water should be everywhere. And we need to work on that. I'm almost done. Uh, so what should we do with this plan? Uh, I'm going to suggest that first of all, we do support the artists who don't know what they're going to do first. I also believe that we need to support the organizations who train the artist in best practices, both material practices as well as the business practices. Artists don't get business training in school, believe it. Artists don't get very much experience working on large scale projects in school. But we do have and use sometimes the organizations who help train the artist and mix that up so that they work across race, across gender, across aesthetic inclinations to create astonishing work. And we need more of that. We need to encourage our city agencies to trust artists and to trust art. So that's what I would set as the goals for the next step. I think that we need to tighten up the plan as it's presented a little bit more. I can tweak it. I'm an editor too. You guys can as well. It's, it's imperfect and I'm okay with that because I'm imperfect too. But I think that we need to activate it in order to make a better Chicago. Um, before we get to Matthew, Emmanuel, did you have a did you want to jump in? I'll, 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 I'll save it, but the, the, the perpetuation in, uh, of segregation is, is just so pervasive in the city. And the negotiation of what we call public art and for who and by who and culture is like the prevailing issue that I'm sure we're going to touch, um, but it, cultivation in culture, like hand in hand, but it, it, our systems are so broken that it's the, it echoed a lot, mm -hmm. so. Matthew, I'm gonna find your media. Yeah. Oh, great, fantastic. Oh. Hello, my name is Matthew Mazzotta, and um, I actually went to school here 20 years ago, I just started realizing that. Uh, at the Art Institute. Um, however, I haven't been here in and out over the years. I'm an artist. I do community-specific, socially engaged public artworks. 
I was going to show one video that kind of illustrates my process and is going to play right into a lot of what John says. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll play that video and then we can jump into some thoughts I had about this plan. What happens when a small town in Nebraska, dealing with the changing face of rural America, invites an artist to take a deeper look into their untapped resources? The Storefront Theater is a unique event space that transforms Main Street into an outdoor theater. It is a collaboration with the people of Lyons, Nebraska, and the surrounding towns to seamlessly weave art into their downtown. The project begins when the Center for Rural Affairs, a local nonprofit focused on strengthening rural communities, small businesses, and family farms, invites artist Matthew Mazzara to organize an art project with the people of Lyons. <laughs> The artist first begins the project by asking people from the community to join him in a living room placed on Main Street as a way to provoke discussion and capture stories and ideas from people that might not feel they have anything to contribute to an artwork. During those Main Street discussions, many community members reveal fond memories of a once thriving downtown and express a strong desire to see the downtown become the center of community life once again. One local person points out that one of the buildings is only a storefront, a wall with no building behind it just an empty lot. Upon investigation, it turns out that this location is owned by the City of Lyons and with its support becomes the site of the art project. What has happened in Lyons has happened all across the country. Small town Main Street USA has suffered as goods, services, entertainment and the jobs that go with them moved away. Buildings that once housed bowling alleys, barber shops, bars, theaters and restaurants have closed their doors. As rural downtowns lie fallow, what will become of these carefully constructed commercial hubs of the past? Well, that's history for you. That, uh, you know, the, they haven't figured out what to do with them all, you know. Uh, um, somebody has to come up with an idea, you know. After the storefront was selected as the site of the project, residents of Lyons came forward to bring their diverse and highly skilled talents to the project, shaping the final design and bringing many other members of the community into the final work of art. Using two hydraulic pump arms, false storefront and metal awning that can be lowered onto the street to form the support structure of the seating. A screen is pulled in when the theater is open. However, both the seats and the screen disappear between events given the impression that there is nothing unusual about this downtown. Only word of mouth informs others about Lyon's secret theater. Before the retractable storefront wall is even conceived, another Lyon's resident, who says he doesn't mind being called eccentric, enters the story. Oh. Bill Hedges, a local mail carrier, recently retired, and decided to take up his lifelong passion of movie making. When Bill first hears of the project, he expresses interest and gives a tour of his basement that includes a personal movie theater, a recreation of a 1950s coffee shop that features a working jukebox, and a full replica of the interior of the spaceship from the 1960s TV show Lost in Space. So you just flip the appropriate switches and it appears for you. Inertial guidance system. Destroy. I'm Bill Hedges, and I've always been a fan of Lost in Space. Bill's passion for the TV show does not end with what he created in his basement. He also recently bought one of the empty storefronts downtown and turned it into a movie set depicting the spaceship's landing site. While building his movie set, Bill also starts to amass a collection of video-making equipment and explains his idea to write and shoot original science fiction movies and cast his cat as the main actor since he decided that human actors would be too costly and unpredictable in their scheduling. When asked, Bill is more than happy to write and shoot a movie called Decades for the project that has downtown Lyons as its focus. The premise of the 45-minute movie is to explore the history of the downtown from the founding of Lyons to the present day as a way to see where the town has been and where it's going. After it's announced that Bill will shoot his movie, he sets a schedule for shooting each decade. People from Lyons and the surrounding community show up as actors dressed in costumes and with vintage cars that match the time period. Right here, she 
is, uh, you know, going to be an extra, but she's also going to direct the extras. He stages scenes such as the old telephone switchboard operator, conversations in the coffee shop, and the elaborate montage of Saturday nights on Main Street in the 1960s. Another Lions native who now works in the movie industry hears about the project and comes back to town with his drone to help shoot lions from above. On a warm night in November, the main street of Lions, which is usually empty after dark, fills with people from the community and beyond for the opening of the storefront theater and the debut of the movie, Decades. As parents, grandparents, and children of all ages gather on Main Street to witness something experimental in their own downtown, they sit side by side to see themselves, their neighbors, and the town they call home reflected so clearly back to them. The storefront theater taps directly into the opportunity that exists in rural towns across America to creatively repurpose and reprogram downtown buildings that once were the backbone of community life into new sites of experience, interaction, and dialogue. The message on this night is simple. People that sit together can dream together. Yeah, I, I work internationally um, and in many different communities. Um, this one happened to be rural, but I thought it could be interesting if you thought about it maybe as a neighborhood as well, something that's been passed over. Um, I'm going to try to jump into the plan as I saw it. Um, it actually is going to bridge off a lot of what John was saying. Anyways, it's got some uh, text I would like to look I at. I mean, straight off the bat, it was interesting. In this section, I think it was section four, it talked all about making work with communities. And even at the bottom, it was like promote collaborative programs to transform vacant and underutilized properties. I mean. That's a lot of the work I'm doing, so I was surprised to see this in here so directly. And then a lot of this is about how do you work with um, communities, um, the city, and local organizations. And that's actually been a little bit of the road I've been walking with the works I've done. I put this up here um, as the way I think about making, putting work in public space. You have temporary. You can do whatever you want. It can be super poignant and contemporary. It's, it's going to be going. The permanent takes a lot more you know, energy of a lot of people agreeing to keep it in a location. And then the system is kind of how I've been thinking about the work I do, which is more, it's almost like a university. It's a permanent gesture, but it refreshes its ideas. And the same thing with that theater that you see there. Even though it's a permanent theater, the community inputs what's going to be played on it. Is it going to be a comedy show? They had a bullying, um, I don't know, event there. Um, Anti-bullying, of course. Um, you know, music, whatever it may be. <laughs> um, so anyways, that, that's something I thought was so interesting, is as how do you make this handoff? Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Let me see if I had something. Yeah. Who runs it after it's open? So this particular project I showed, the Storefront Theater, um, the Center for Rural Affairs, which is a, is a nonprofit that deals with community issues, wrote the grant. They commissioned us to run this process, and we involved many people. We got it done, but then the city actually owned it afterwards, and you rent the theater through the library. You kind of check it out if you want to do a public event. If you want to do a private event, I think they have it, so it costs money. However, I'm working in Louisville now, um, and that's the city is sponsoring that project, and that's kind of going off what John says. Um, I keep on going back to you because you actually said artists that don't know what they're doing. We don't know what that project's going to be. So you have to find your way to the end. However, one of the people that has stepped up is the YMCA. So it might be a city project then programmed by a private organization. So this, I think, becomes more curious or how do you land a project is, is interesting. And each one has been different. And that 
and this is more from my side of being commissioned to do an artwork, there's a couple of people of now, or a couple of cities or whatever, have a two-phase contract. They have the money and they agree that we're gonna run a process and not just a commission for a project. So they give me a design phase and then the, the realization phase, but the money's already up there. So it's basically, they wanna be able to sign off in the design phase to pop over into being fabricated. So I thought that was kind of interesting, some of the things that artists are navigating. All right, let's see what this says. Build awareness of the engagement with Chicago's public art. Okay. Um, one of the things I thought about, and this could f uh, go into another category as well, um, the collections. And so all the work I've been doing is about making videos at the end. That's how people experience the work firsthand there, but how does someone else experience it? And so like the video you guys saw, it's about framing a context and then placing the intervention in it. And so it's about telling the story of that location. And sometimes that's actually super valuable to give us a broader perspective on the world. However, people have used these videos as teaching tools, I've heard, uh, in other locations. Um, this is just what is in the plan right now. I won't go into it all. Um, but it, I thought it was kind of missing this one thing about this documentation of video. And the reason I want to go into it, this is another project I did. Um, I won't speak about it much. It's actually very similar to the uh, project I showed the store frontier. This one's called Open House. This was done in another small community in Alabama. However, when I released this video, I remember one of the first articles that came out was in Jakarta. And uh, I actually had to translate all this. I don't know what language that is actually. But anyways, and they got the project. They understood this is a community. Um, actually, that whole project was a community blight. We took a, a house down and then we made it into a new house that transforms into a theater, plays movies and, and, and shows and all that stuff. But anyways, this is when it started hitting me that you know, the work has a second life, not only for that community, but it actually plays into other conversations that people have at city halls or universities to kind of push forward another type of artwork or to get community involvement. So I was just thinking that could be cool for this public art plan is that maybe there's a whole bunch of videos that for works that need more of a story told than a static piece. So anyways, that's kind of the little bits I had. Some of that, both of them. Um, <clears throat> one of the challenges, uh, I'm just gonna figure out how to be politically correct, um, but politics is part of the issue. It, you, you want a predictable formulaic thing called art to be in a public space that you wanna make sure you hit your numbers then it is a serious question in terms of who's your audience. Is this actually for a certain level of engagement? Is it a, is it a, is it a healing process to the memory and the scarring that is the city of Chicago that is like torn apart by its racism, by its segregation, by its just disparateness? Like it's, so to avoid the perpetuation of, of a certain approach towards art as a commodity and the thingifying of the of the product that allows for an un unpredictability that allows for actual creative processes to happen that is the unpredictable which is the restoring so people can heal in order to move forward into a future to collectively that is what i think is missing in a lot of when we talk about public art I mean, it's, it's like a packaged deal. And so one of, my, one of my challenges, and I had a great opportunity of working um, with, uh, the team from CTA was actually great. We did a, an installation at the, um, the Red Line on the 63rd Street. Um, and it, it was an interesting intervention because I was like, well, you know, the Red Line, redlining, that's appropriate, South Side Chicago started to sample from some of the stories and the restoring that we were doing through the connections through food and healing and education and jobs and this that, and the other and rethinking the spaces but then taking the stripping i mean one of the things that we were warned was we could not i mean there was a concern that any likeness of the audience that with which we worked would not be somebody that would be a criminal 
because we work with a particular population that is highly incarcerated. So there was a negotiation of, wait, we got to be careful of what image we project on the space. But they, to their, with their support, allowed us to do an installation that allowed for the restoring and negotiating. So I had to take like a, an abstracted view of the, of the people. But it was an interesting tension because there was this like, we need to be safe here in what the image is and what's, what's the response. We don't want a certain kind of like retaliation to the image. It was a really interesting thing in a public space. But then what's happened as a byproduct is that the residuals, when people recognize themselves or their, their act in the image, they're starting to use the space as a vehicle to bring to other people to share their image on this, as an intermediary space between two different neighborhoods that otherwise would not have a bridge. And it is that level of unpredictability that it's ironic that then is what the media and the press want because then it's just no, it's a safe story and it's, it's really feel good. Um, I mean, but it's real. So part of the negotiation that we had in, in our panel and discussion was like, what do you want the artist to do? If you're in a neighborhood that has been stripped to its bare essence, so it has been stripped of its memory of itself. So it is a, it is a, there's a process of erasure that is a forced amnesia in the south and west sides of Chicago, but it's not only here, Detroit, it's other places, but it's so, we have, we have a population density that is technically rural and nobody wants to talk about that. So the thing that resonated about all of the interventions is that we actually are doing a rural type of intervention that rethinks what is a farm, what is a barn, so we can reactivate the spaces through people to do theater in public space and meet a whole bunch of people that ne never would meet before. So I, I, the, the metrics need to be made teased a bit. The metrics of like, what are your numbers? What are your objectives? What are your outcomes? What are all this stuff? It really is a deterrent to most artists because they do not want to go through that process. They sh almost to a degree, I wouldn't question if they should be forced to go through that process. It's a good, it's a healthy process for those that can go through it. But I mean, I don't know, it's kind of antithetical to the art. Did any of you notice that during the press conference, when Mayor Rahm Emanuel, our Mayor Rahm Emanuel was speaking about the year of public art, that somehow the description of that, um, which was, as far as I understand it, a comparison, you know, a, uh, a celebration of both the dedication of the Picasso sculpture and a celebration of the wall of respect, that somehow the wall of respect in the mayor's description was disappeared, became invisible, and that, in, that instead his two um, benchmarks for describing the year of public art were the dedication of the Picasso sculpture and the opening of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. I think that was um, uh, a very poignant example of how history is erased and about uh, the challenges that we face in trying to negotiate this space of public art. I, um, several years ago, attended a, a meeting in this very bu building to talk about public art, and I think that DK said, and for that particular m meeting, did a, a great job at convening um, every representative of the ecosystem that is the art world in Chicago. And at one point, um, one of the former uh, curators at the Art Institute of Chicago um, uh, accused the city of not having enough vigilance in their patrolling of the type of art that was placed on the, on the lakefront. Because as, you, as we all know, the lakefront of Chicago is the art our best marketing piece. Um, it is, <laughs> it, it describes um, Chicago as a center of tourism and we are able to attract international, tra you know, travelers and tourists to the city by putting these spiffy public art pieces 
in that space. So anyway, um, this what this curator was implying, obviously, was that the um, the work that had been placed in the, on the uh, lakefront did not have the aesthetic quality that that space deserved. So what does that mean? I, th I thought it was an awkward moment in that conversation myself, and Julie Bur Bur Burroughs, who's no longer with us at DK, raised the question at that point. So what is the role of government in public art? <laughs> what is the role of government in public art? And, you know, it, it really got me started thinking, and it, it made me think about another meeting that I attended in a neighborhood in Chicago. And at this meeting, there were a bunch of uh, architects and designers who were presenting proposals about how to repurpose vacant lots across the city. And I will never um, forget this particular moment. It was very dramatic. And there was a, a, someone from the Resurrection Project there because they were talking specifically about vacant lots in Little Village. And this guy was so excited about the presentations and the ideas and the possibilities that were being thrown around the room. And finally, he just, he, he could hardly control himself and he stood up and he said, we want our own frijole. We want our own frijole. And so my point in comparing these two meetings is to say that public art changes its meaning as it moves across the city. So the, what is Cloudgate in, and the Bean in Millennium Park in Little Village becomes the Friole. And both are loved and both are of equal aesthetic you know, importance, but they, requ they, they, it's up to us in moving this public art plan forward, I think, to really be conscious and intentional about the different contexts and the different people and the different places that exist and make this city so great. I mean, in order for public art to have both power and presence, it has to relate to the people and the culture and the, of the place that it's in. Uh, yeah, I'll just add to that. Thank you for a good setup, if I can follow it in a good way. Um, we really need to see how to get the city's budget restructured so that it's not itself so siloed and really wrapped into what the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events can do. We need to see that our aldermen believe that 1% of their menu money, which is what was basically spent this year on the year of public art for each of them, should be 10% of their menu money each year. Then, over a period of five years, you would have an astonishing array of things across the city. But if not that, we at least need to look for ways to infuse artist presence, taking chances, not knowing what's gonna get done, but to do it in places that do not now experience that creative process. When I was a kid, believe me, when I was a kid, people could sing, they went to church, or they, they had played piano at home, or there was all sorts of artistic forms that people would do. And today, for a whole range of reasons, people don't feel like they have much responsibility or capacity to be creative, and for them to participate with these artists in a creative process near their home is transformative. It's not simply being a good observer and, and enjoying the view. It's actually taking responsibility to have skills, have knowledge, but build skills and build knowledge and to create work. And that's what I think we need to do in the future in this city. Done preaching. My father was a preacher. Yeah. Um, well, they're both good setups. I, I was thinking that, you know, when I s went to Taft High School in Chicago, I was, uh, you could declare yourself an art major, which meant the first three periods, um, I had studio art. You know, this was, and, and I say that because um, 
we've lost a lot of that. You know, I think it's hard to talk about the, the vision of a plan without talking about, um, you know, just being young. And, and it's, you know, it's not sort of placed literally in the plan, you know, the word child or, you know, the idea of connecting up the city with the future. Um, and, you know, I'm working with some young people who, you know, don't make young art um, or childlike art, but they think of themselves as sculptors, you know. Um, and they're 10 and they're 14 and they're 18. Um, and they've always thought of themselves that way. And a lot of what they have to do is sort of self-educate and find spaces that, um, that don't interrupt those feelings that they have about wanting to kind of participate. And that's like the best statement in the whole plan for me, which is right at the beginning, offering this kind of broad opportunity for participation. You know? And I work with senior citizens who sort of build things too. And um, you know, I think one of the ways is we have to dress like you know, the same spaces, the same names, right? The same kind of projects. Um, I would hope that, you know, when Emmanuel and I were in that one panel around looking at some of these other sort of enterprises that were going around the city, that that's just sort of a starting point. That's about, you know, the city really giving us a clear picture of what public art is and how do we, um, bring in the people that, you know, we've been working with to kind of uh, participate in that. Yeah. One other quick thing. Um, my, my own personal pathway, and I think all, all of us echo this, is uh, having relationships with um, artistic art institutions in the city that have actually helped me and I'm sure all of us navigate being an artist in this city, because being an artist in this city is 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 a challenge if you're going to do it in the in in these different territories and platforms and hierarchies of politics and what have you. Um, but having a partnership with like High Park Art Center, which allowed me a space to think, literally just a space to here's a room, here's a space to bring in and engage and think and play, and then we'll just you know we sustain our relationship and our partnership and then now that has led to the international component Ireland you know, Museum of Modern Art partnering in and so and so the Mexican Museum of Modern Art bringing in Cuban artists it's the sustained relationships and the cultivation of thoughts and ideas over periods of time that's allowing us to really begin to like with a generational outlook I wanted, I want, I, I, I'm, I'm in this for the long haul, I mean, all of you are, and I'm inspired by all of their work, and so having the continuity and having these, these museums or gallery spaces as echoes, as an indoor component, as, you know, navigating education and, and the commodity, the, the art as on a wall or in a space, but then having, pushing it back out into rethinking public space is like integral, and this city, with its scarred past and history, has a prime opportunity to figure out how to, to do that, to activate a space in a way that intentionally talks about its past and present and potential future. We, we are so quick in this city to focus on the things that work because you wanna hide the things that don't. But there is a way to, it, but that perpetuates a downward slope that is extremely um, dangerous as it strips us void of all of our humanity. And there is an insertion point of art to figure out how to recapture our humanity right now that does not fit in the, the certain aesthetic on the lakefront. First, I would say that this has been a really inspirational two days, and I'm really glad that I came. I grew up in Chicago, and right now I uh, go back and forth between here and New York. 
So there's certain things that I see in balance. I think New York does a better job in terms of promoting the arts than Chicago does, even though the community here is just as rich as the community in New York. But one comment that was made about government and whether you know, Rahm Emanuel says certain things, it's kind of like overly optimistic to think of the government as leading, certainly not in terms of artists. And I think the artists are always gonna be in advance of the government and the government's always gonna be playing catch up. But in terms of getting funding, I'll say two things that are contradictory. One, I also think that you can get more funds from the government by taking advantage of the tourists who do come here. Every, everyone who stays in a hotel gets additional taxes taken. And if you take like the 1% for art model and use it, people might object if you say 1%, but even if you said half of 1% is gonna raise millions of dollars for the arts community. And then you could look and you say, well, where is the public art truly lacking? Okay, because I'm a big fan of all of the public art that I see downtown, but it's truly lacking in some of the other neighborhoods on the south side and the west side. And you say, well, this particular area, I mean, you could literally break it down. Where is there no public art? Then those places would get priority for the funds that you get there, which is not to say that the other communities don't get it, but you would prioritize it. And I understand that you're gonna get into a thing of you know, who chooses, who gets to choose, but taking all of the ideas that have been expressed, like the community will get some input, input, the artists who are already in that community who are not being supported yet could also get input, but there's definitely a real possibility for it. So. Yeah, can I respond to that really sure. quickly? I, in, the, uh, in the first goal, in the, I think the bullets read pretty well in terms of like organizing oversight over just general public um, art projects and timelines and such. But you know, when you, when you hit the one line, like line six that says about eligibility, you know? I mean, that just sort of like takes the wind out of my sail, right? Because I've read that so many times about, well, this is really gonna be about a certain kind of control that I, I have no sort of say in, right? Someone's gonna choose. And I think what I've seen in the city, um, and not necessarily only connected to public art, but that these sort of selection processes are so tied with public policy, you know, and then back and forth, it's a circle. Um, and I think we have to somehow figure out a way to kind of break that. No, well, I mean, I totally understand how it could, you know, lead step two even to being problematic. But you have all of the artists who are like from the panels, especially yesterday, who are talking about coming up against the system. But even if you know, even if you did a, a program like Materials for the Arts, where you know the people who aren't using the you know like materials that are left over from construction projects, from decorating projects, from all sorts of projects, and you make that available to the artists, even that alone would help some of the people. I mean, I you know I've met so many artists here and I'm probably on one hand the amount of people who don't have to have a full-time day job that has, you know, they're lucky, something to do with the art. But for the most part, nothing to do with the art. You know, and I was the last just thing I'll say without hogging the mic, the last, even like the wall of respect, the artist Doug Williams is the person who gave them the paint because he was a school teacher and he had access to the paint. So, you know. Yeah. Well, I was just, I did a public project in St. Paul recently, and the state of Minnesota um, has taxed a penny um, on their property taxes, I believe, that just goes to the art, and then another penny that just goes to the environment. Just raises millions of dollars. No one has a problem with it. Thank you, everyone. This was a really thought-provoking and interesting conversation, and I appreciate all your viewpoints. I think one of the strengths of Chicago is our neighborhoods, that we've got the Puerto Rican neighborhood and the Ukrainian and the, you know, here and there. But it's also, as was pointed out, the segregation is one of our biggest problems. And um, in the idea that I'm all about, also the community coming together to say something about where they live, I also think one of the challenges we have is to cross fertilize and break down the walls of the thing. I think the neighborhood started after World War II where we had to define things by a square mile. 
um, so that people would take care of themselves and watch out for each other. But we're in a different realm now. And I think it's trying to see what can I do over there, all over the city, and how can we uh, address some of the art deserts, and how can we reach out beyond uh, just um, the immediate groove we get caught into. So one of the reasons why we did the Thought Barn as a 21st century response to cities, planning, the process of architecture, we're reverse engineering, actually architecture, um, having a timber frame barn structure that was hand raised by the community. It was, it was a barn raising celebration event with 300 people that was with music and food and what have you to bring people from outside in to do something collectively productive with reciprocal generosities imbued all the way through. To have a structure that is unfinished to be celebrated as a pavilion on a farm in a neighborhood that used to be a warehouse for prison, I mean, like a pipeline to prison for kids that would otherwise not make it out of that neighborhood. To talk about the erasure of the housing and what's possible by doing a collaborative project with DCASE around public art and bringing in public artists in, also with the Chicago Architecture Foundation and their youth to try and figure out how to bring in neighborhoods into this neighborhood, but to listen first. You can't come into this area without listening and you, can't, you have to listen to the stories and respond reciprocally to the stories that you hear about to claim the formerly private spaces into public space. So there's like, for, for, for myself and I think all of us on stage, like there's, a, there's, a, there's a process of bringing people in to listen, to respond, um, that pushes it back out to bring more people back in. And it is, that is part of the process of like art inspiring imagination, reclaiming our humanity, figuring out how to shift the built environment, and it is very unpredictable. And you do have to have mediators and people that can translate from one dialect and language to the next, to the next, to the next, but it is so regenerative that it, it can accelerate the pathways of production and restoring and healing of a neighborhood and intersection of neighborhoods if it is embraced and practiced in the right way and not as a gentrifying tool. I would also add to that uh, because you mentioned the underpasses. The underpasses are just over 100 years old and if you look at them at all, you know that they're really deteriorating and the deterioration is going to accelerate and that means there's any huge infrastructure project coming. Those underpasses have strengthened segregation. They have been used exactly to divide neighborhoods and races. And as Emmanuel and others have pointed out, they have also been places where people have chosen to join each other rather than be separated from each other. And so that opportunity as it evolves, whether they're brand new underpasses or refurbished ones, those kinds of places can become a much different sort of experience for all of us as we think about our city. Oh, and if we took the cost of it, this is the thing I'd like to know. I'd like to know how much the graffiti spray painters cost. Not just the, their salary, I want to know their truck, the equipment, the paint, who cleans up the paint. I want to know the office cost for the air conditioning and for the lights. I want to know who replaces the cost of a, a proportional share of the coffee pot when it uh, breaks down, and their pensions. Because that's what the cost of having graffiti painted out is. It's all of those things. And if we took that kind of money and applied it to public spaces, we would have a different Materials, yeah. effect on the world. Yeah. Oh, one other last thing I was also, um, we're gonna talk about that, hopefully. Um, the Smart Museum recently asked as a commission piece to collectively do an installation. So I brought in like all of the youth, all of the apprentices into the public space, which is their cafe area as a threshold between the other two galleries. It was really interesting because we got to bridge from one side of Washington Park to the other. And it was, a, it was an interesting 
If you cross one side of Washington Park where the University of Chicago is, and where there's bike lanes, and you go through it, and you realize there's no more bike lanes when you cross outside of Washington Park, then you, the, the, the density is very different. But it was having, allowing our youth to do an installation in that space in a very public way. It was very unpredictable in the process of the installation, even though we had to like propose what we were going to do. We had to do a 30 by 17 foot wall drawing, which is like rethinking a, a foreclosed warehouse. And people are seeing this space in the, in the Smart Museum right now saying, what is that? What is this thing? And then have our youth actually give a virtual tour of what they think should happen in their neighborhood. It's causing people to go from the Smart Museum to cross Washington Park to visit a neighborhood they never saw, and reciprocally vice versa. It's the type of engagements that we're all talking about and you need to be embraced in, in that level of unpredictably. Sure, you can, do, you can do a proposal for a gallery, fine. But allow for it to push back out and have this reciprocal engagement so that now we're, going, we're doing a series of quote unquote radical reconstruction dinners and series, and this is a shameless plug, but um, we are trying to invite people to have these conversations of what is the role of art in rethinking labor land um, in, in our city so we can move past some of these, these stagnation points and pains and, 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 and actually to bring people together to share some ideas. Are we wrapping up? We're wrapping up. I just, just one more thing, I want to, uh, point out that the year of public art was a top-down mandate from the mayor to the Department of Cultural Affairs, and that the Department of Cultural Affairs is, um, I think, has a, a really minimal infrastructure that has been allowed to deteriorate over the years, and that it's up to us in this room to advocate and make sure that D-Case gets the, the support that they need in order to move this plan forward. It's, I, I just think it's really important that that we take off our artist hats for a moment and put on our citizen hats and and sort of embrace the idea that, you know, we need to talk to our neighbors and our aldermen and make sure that the the importance and the possibility of public art in Chicago is, um, you know, becomes something that we all believe in. And Barbara wants to add to that. I do. I was thinking the same sort of thing, Joyce. Um, and uh, I used to work here at the case for a long time, and was part of the public art program for a while. Um, do I need a microphone? Yeah, you need. Okay, sorry. And so I don't. And so I wanted to second that. I don't think we should wait for D case to do anything. I don't think we should wait for the city to do anything. But I think that clearly. The plan gives us an opportunity to talk about public art, to look at the checklist that they came up with, and to maybe take it on ourselves to make 2018 the year where Chicago talks about public art and where each of us who's working with young people especially makes a concerted effort to, um, to talk about public art in the neighborhood where we are, and maybe there's even a way to coordinate that so that these conversations are happening and what parts of the plan do we like and what parts of the plan don't we like and what do we want to see, what, is, what do we want to change and what do we want to keep the same and we do that and we figure out what we want and then we go back to the three people who are implementing all the visual arts programs for the city of Chicago and the Department of Cultural Affairs and the 50 aldermen and the mayor and whoever else and say okay we had your plan now we took a year and we had these conversations with young people, with people who've done this in all the different neighborhoods, and here's our plan. We could totally do that, but we need to, we need to step up and commit. And I think that's what you're talking about, Joyce. Um, and so, yes. um, so, I don't know, what is that, Yopa Chicago? Or, <laughs> so we can talk about how we do that, if you want. Um, I just wanted to let folks know that 
2018 has been now deemed the year of creative youth. So it's not as if, you know, it's like everything else, like Black History Month or Women's History Month. It's like, you know, people are what they are and they continue to be what they are, but there's this little blip where we acknowledge them. And um, to kind of keep the energy going for the 2000s, you know, the year of public art, it's like now we have this thing for youth. It's like we've been talking about inserting youth, but they're not actually mentioned or really focused on. It's like, you know, this is another bandwagon that we can use um, to our advantage to kind of keep that energy moving forward. One more. Karen. So it's important to reflect on, you know, I was in, interested in what the uh, city officials were saying about public art with it being fun and then um, how you all have been, as art practicing artists, have been talking about public art with um, you know, the, the emphasis on public engagement. And I've, I was just came back from doing a public engagement project in Liverpool, and they were, they, um, they wanted, um, they basically invited me because they saw another piece of work and they wanted me to uh, replicate that, you know. And I was like, well, you know, I'm doing the research. <laughs> and, and, you know, public engagement does, it's not predictable, it can't be defined. But it is about these profound and deeply moving experiences that then leave a legacy in communities. And I think, you know, that is something, you know, having worked with sat on funding committees in Chicago and, you know, being on the policy end as well as uh, practicing, there's um, a long education that needs to happen in the city. And, you know, there's been, you, you know, it's kind of sad to me that a lot of the city officials that we are constantly having conversations with to educate about these things weren't sat in these chairs over the last two days where really important conversations. Uh, yesterday was a phenomenal conversation, you know, really talking about the erasure of culture and the state of am amnesia that exists in our city due to segregation. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, they've put up these orchids and they're celebrating all these kind of, you know, beautiful pieces, but where is the profound? Let's have a convert. Let, let's talk about deeply moving and profound work because that's what we as artists want to create. I, I do uh, want to uh, say that it, it's so critical uh, to get people involved. And uh, before I went to graduate school at the Art Institute, I did work in the Chicago public school system in West Town. And uh, at that time, there's, and even now, I mean, there's still a, a diverse range of populations that attend schools. Uh, I was on uh, Walcott and Division. And I encouraged my students to create designs for murals that I uh, had painted on five by seven foot uh, pieces of masonite. And I will tell you, you know, you can't always uh, rely or even discuss what the possibilities of uh, this kind of trust that administrators need to uh, endow the artists with, because the principal of that school said, "Yes, you know, I trust that you know uh, you're going to do an intense job with uh, these students." And and that's uh, you know again going back to the park district. You know, this is fun, and and we're walking around, taking walks, and this is fun, but. There is a real sense of urgency about doing art. And uh, when those students came up with the four murals, I made sure before the five years uh, of my 
uh, experiences being the art department uh, in that school, that those engineers drilled those masonite <laughs> uh, murals onto the walls. And then I find out 10 years later, my husband is a sociologist, and they did a study at the University of Chicago about schools that are, uh, you know, just ruined with vandalism, and this school had a pride in the work that was in the hallways, and nobody would touch the lockers or, you know, create, uh, you know, inappropriate kinds of hatred uh, in those hallways because there was a sense of ownership with that space and how it interacted with the community. Uh, bringing uh, the community members in to celebrate the work of those students. They were high school students, uh, two years. Uh, they would come to Anderson uh, High School and Vocational Center before they went to Clemente High School. And I think there was a real sense of joy about being recognized that there was a voice uh, that was critical to their identities, and, and that's what really needs to be, uh, I think, talked about to the, the politicians who are, you know, already saying, you know, well, there was a Picasso, and, um, you know, these are people who are already internationally known, but we need to support people who are developing their, their interest and their uh, confidence in being able to, to say something uh, that, also reflects who they are and what these spaces mean to them. And maybe, you know, in the spring we can uh, reconvene and uh, as was suggested uh, by Barbara, that we take some responsibility right now to go into, you know, people uh, or communities or organizations or art centers or whoever we think might be able to fund uh, our ideas so that we can really make this into a reality before waiting, well, you know, will you get this grant, will you not get this grant? I work for the, also the uh, Illinois Arts Council, and when one of the teachers said, we, you know, we don't want to go through the Arts Council this year, can you raise funds? I went to the banks in the neighborhood. so. Yeah, <laughs> those people are in that community. They go to the bank, um, and, and we raised fun, funding for uh, a project in, in the school in the Pullman area, uh, you know, before it would, you know, go through this, this long uh, grant-making process that they seem to want to avoid. It's, um, it's 4 o'clock, <laughs> and we have to let our tech people go. Yeah. Um, but I want to thank all of you for um, spending time with us and sharing your thoughts and being frank um, and for including us in your thinking. We appreciate it. Barbara, I'll, I'll host that meeting. I'll host the meeting in spring or summer. Just whoever, yeah, just let me know. Thanks, everyone, very much. <laughs>